Let's start off by talking about exercise. Mm -hmm. How often do you exercise? When you talk about exercise, exercise, I don't really exercise that much. But then I do other forms of exercise, if you can take that into the category exercise. So I like to dance. I like to do yoga. I like to go for a walk. So I'm sure that's included in exercise. So if you talk about that, I think every day, at least an hour. So yeah, I do like to take care of my body and I do like to invest in my body. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite exercise? So I think I'd like to say dance because it's it's funny because it's mindless. You don't realize you're exercising. When you're dancing, it's just one hour of uh, catharsis. You're just going and sweating it out and you don't realize that you've worked out for an hour. So yeah, I think I'll say dance. Are there any exercises you do not like? I wouldn't say I don't like. I do like lifting weights, but it's not one of my favorite part of the exercise. It's something which I find uh, monotonous, something which I find uh, cumbersome, something which I find boring. So yes, lifting weights. Do you prefer to exercise indoors or outdoors? Mm, I think both. When the weather allows, then outdoors. But otherwise, I'm more of an indoor person. I don't mind uh, doing yoga every single day in my room. I know like a lot of people don't enjoy that. They need an environment. They need a setup. They need to go to the gym, which is also indoors. But uh, I do enjoy indoors and I do enjoy just exercising in my home, in my room. And that being said, I also enjoy working out in uh, outside uh, facility as well. Like I like going for walks. I like going for a run. So yeah, I think both. Now let's talk about weekends. How do you normally spend your weekends? Weekends, I usually have more classes. I'm a yoga teacher. So my weekends are not uh, a normal weekend for other people where they go out for lunches, dinners and celebrate. For me, weekends are more heavy on work. But uh, if I can say that Monday is my weekend or Tuesday is my weekend, then I like to watch movies. I really like watching Netflix and I like to spend time with my husband. I also like cooking and that's the time in which I get for myself. So yes, I think I like spending it in the house and really giving that time to myself and my husband. Do you like to spend your weekends in your local area or do you like to travel? So it depends. It's both. If I have a lot of time to myself, in the sense if I have two days off or three days off, I like to go out on a vacation, like a mini trip. So I like to go out, probably uh, do like a picnic, go out to a park or maybe explore any other countryside, any other city. But if it's a short duration, if it's only a day, then probably spend it in the house, like I mentioned earlier. Are there any interesting things to do in your local area on the weekend? Yes, there are a lot of coffee shops. And there's a coffee shop right beneath my house, <laughs> so which is very popular in London. It's called Gales. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, nice places around my neighborhood. But I wouldn't say that I like going to those places because they're very uh, familiar. I would like to go to places which are a little away. So I would like to travel a little bit and enjoy the entire journey of reaching a place. But yes, my neighborhood is also quite uh, friendly and social. Do you prefer to go out or stay in? at the weekend? So like I mentioned earlier, if it's a short weekend, if it's only a day and a half, then staying in is better for me. And because there are a lot of things that I need to finish. So I prefer staying in. But if it is a longer weekend, like in the sense that you also have a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's a three days, then I like to probably step out and probably explore other uh, neighborhood cities and towns and villages here. Yeah. Now let's talk about reading. What was your favorite book when you were a child? I can't go back that far, like when I was a child, but I do remember somewhere in school, probably towards the end of school, I loved this book called Many Masters, Many Lives. And I think I like to call myself an old soul because when I was a child, I still was very inclined towards spirituality. And I really liked to know where we've come from, where would we go after life, before death, you know, those kind of things. So uh, after death, after life. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's, I think, a book which rings a bell, which I always get reminded of. How often do you read? So uh, as of now, my reading is very education based. I have a lot of books on yoga a lot of books on spirituality. I'm very less on fiction, but I 
try and listen a little bit of fiction as well. So I listen to the audio books. It's called Audible. So I have that app with me. So I think when I'm on uh, on the tube, when I'm traveling, it's always the Audible, the book which I listen to. And uh, when I'm at home and when I'm trying to educate myself and I'm trying to know more about yoga, then it's probably, I think, overall an hour a day or maybe sometimes an hour in two days. Mm-hmm. Do you like to read when on holiday? Um, depends. Like I said, most of my reading reading is education based, so I need to dedicate time to it uh, to just the reading part of it. But when I'm on vacation, then I don't write, like to re- educate myself. So it depends. But sometimes I do like to read. Uh, I think when I'm on a vacation, I'd rather go for just listening to a book. And do you prefer to read physical books or e-books? I think I prefer to read physical books. I do have a Kindle as well, but I think it's been longest that I've touched it. I like to have the feel of it, to turn the pages in real. So I do prefer a physical book. Now let's talk about history. Mm-hmm. Do you enjoy watching TV shows about history? Yes. But I'd like to put it uh, this way. I enjoy history, but I like more of the crime-based histories. There are a lot of events which have happened in certain countries, certain part of towns. So I like to know more about that. I'm very heavy on crime-based series. Mm-hmm. So uh, yes, and sometimes I also like to watch just the history bit as well. Mm-hmm. Like I I think I've seen that entire show on Netflix called The Roman Empire or something like that. But that's also because it's very heavy on drama. Mm-hmm. It's very heavy on the crime based as well. So I think I do have an inclination towards that. Did you enjoy studying history in school? As far as I remember, I don't really have a clear memory of reading or learning history in school, which of course we did. It was it was there in our textbooks. But I think I grew more fond and more interested in history way later when I started reading about civilizations, when I started reading about different areas and regions and how the world was divided and then, you know, invaded by different uh, uh, kingships, if I, may can, I can call that. Uh, so yes, it was only later that I started getting interested in history. So it says, uh, describe a time when you were late for something. So I'm usually a very punctual person and I can't think of any time when I was really late, but there have been a few instances. And one such instance was when I got really, really late was for my work. So I'm new to London and I've started teaching yoga over here. It's been about six to eight months and I'm still understanding the tube work, like how does the commute work over here? How does the uh, bus work over here? and uh, also the timings and everything. So I'm still adjusting myself to the city. So there was this one class I was supposed to reach after two classes, which I was always all, already taking in Angel. So there was this one area called Angel. I was taking two classes over there. Right after that, there was another class in another area and I was supposed to reach there. This another class wasn't mine. So I was covering for someone and I got like a last moment uh, notification that can you take this class? And I accepted it, really vouching for it and really saying that I will be there. It was very disheartening for me because by the time I wrapped up the studio and I left from there, I couldn't make it on time. And this is a big professional setback on my end because I shouldn't be doing that. And uh, what happened was that I went for, uh, I thought I'll take a bus. So I took a bus and... uh, By the time I was about to reach a certain location, I realized I've taken the wrong bus. So I got down and then I tried to take a train. So by the time I tried to reach the next best train location, I realized that the train station was shut. That is when I started panicking. I started uh, looking for a cab and I started contacting my DM, which is like a manager who's always on call and checking if you're on time or not. And the DM told me this is really sad because it looks like I'll not be able to reach on time. And even five minutes late is late for students. So they did, uh, they started asking questions like, why is it that the train station is stopped, like in the sense it's shut? Because probably I think they weren't believing me in that moment. But uh, later when I described everything, I clicked pictures and finally they believed me. And when I reached... <laughs> That's the two minutes are okay. up. Well done. Right. Okay. You've been telling me about a time when you were late, and we're now going to discuss arriving late and being punctual. Right. Is it rude to be late if you're meeting a friend? 
To thank you for watching this video, I want to give you a free course that has helped thousands of students improve their IELTS speaking score. What it's going to do is take you through every single part of the test and give you strategies for part one, part two, and part three, and also allow you to practice at home for free and get feedback. To sign up for that for free, all you have to do is just click the link in the description. Thanks very much, and let's get back to the video. In a way, yes. Uh because uh, I think I'll say if you're constantly late, if you're always late, it's a yes. It is rude because you're playing with someone's time. Someone has specially dedicated their time to you and vice versa. Even you've dedicated your time to them. So in a way, yes, because uh, that person could have done a lot of things in that much time. But also sometimes no, because uh, you never know what is that person going through. I mean, in the sense, uh, it's it's a friend, right? It's not a profession. Sometimes I've had my friends complaining that Aparna, it's all right. I mean, you can chill because oh, we're just meeting for a coffee. So it's okay if they get a little bit late. If it's only like 10, 15 minutes, it's fine. What should happen to people if they are consistently late for work? Well, I think it's a big no because you're answerable for a lot of people and you have to deliver a job, a product or something in that profession. And if you get late, it's not only you who's uh, suffering, but it's also the entire company who's suffering because of you. So I think they need to learn how to manage their time well. And there should be some kind of a repercussion for that so that they are being more careful and mindful in the future. What can people do to become more punctual? Okay, so I have this trick, which is a um, lot of times I've noticed that people who are constantly late, they take the deadline as the deadline. For example, if they have to be somewhere at 10, they'll think, okay, I have to be there at 10. I'd like to put it the other way. I'll say, keep your time 15 minutes earlier. Say that you have to reach there by 9.45 or probably 9.30 if you have a habit of constantly being late. That way you'll start early, getting, you'll start getting ready earlier, you'll leave the place earlier, you're home earlier, and probably you'll be on time. You can set a time alarm, you can uh, set a timer, you can really make use of these things in order to be on time, I think. Now let's talk about work productivity. Mm -hmm. Is it better to work for long interrupted periods of time or to take multiple small breaks? Hmm. In my opinion, I think to take many multiple breaks because uh, it doesn't matter how long you're working. If you've refreshed yourself and if you have come to your full capacity, mental capacity to work, even if you work in short bursts, that could be more productive. And uh, yes, I think that's what I think about work productivity. Are open plan offices good for productivity? What do you mean by open plan offices? So... Um, some offices are, cubicles are, are have cubicles and they're mm -hmm. closed or offices that are mm -hmm. closed. And then some offices are just tables in a big room and uh -huh. everyone can see each other working. All right. Well, it depends. I'm not really sure how it works because uh, either it works for them because uh, it's a very social environment. You can relax and you're not like really just into work because that can also play with your uh, stress maybe. But in a way, also no, because then you can get, you have the chances to get distracted sooner. And if you're working in a closed environment, then you can probably take out that small burst of time, which I was talking about, and just dedicate it to your work. Some people believe companies should move to a four day week. Mm -hmm. Do you think this would improve overall productivity? I think I'm a big advocate for that because I really feel there should be a good work life balance where you're working and also you have time for yourself. When you're constantly only working, which is like six days a week, probably, that, that ways you don't have time for yourself, you don't have time for your family, you don't have time for your hobbies and interests, which plays a big role in your stress. So if you have four days a week, that means that you have, you have more time for yourself. And by default, you will be able to focus on your work because you've uh, been able to take care of other parts and uh, categories in your life, you know. Now let's talk about AI in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Which jobs are most likely to be affected by AI in the future? I'm not sure, but I think uh, maybe the film industry. I feel that a lot of the editing will be taken care of by AI 
because I have noticed and I've come across a lot of people who are using only AI for editing on Instagram. So that just rang a bell in my head because I thought, oh, oh, if that is the case, then probably the film industry will be the one which will suffer because uh, most of their jobs are done by human labor, right? So if AI takes over, then it will make their jobs easier, but also take away jobs from their hands. If AI takes millions of people's jobs in the future, how will society change? Financially, I'm not very sure because that will reduce uh, the jobs for a lot of people. But I also feel that um, people will have more time to themselves and people will have more space to figure out the other kind of jobs that they should be doing. So in a way, a lot of workload, if you look with a positive perspective, a lot of workload will be taken away from them and will give them a lot more space to decide what do, what would they want to do with their time. And are there any positive consequences of AI replacing millions of workers? I think this is very similar to what I just mentioned, that yes, you can look at it positively as well. But I did mention that I'm not very sure how will it play financially on people. But the positive side effect or positive effect can be that it can unburden or take away the burden from a lot of people and uh, give them more space and time to utilize in other activities of their life. So you're hoping to get a band nine, which is a very, very high score. What I will do is I'll give you feedback on part one, part two, and part three of the test. And then I'll give you feedback on the four marking criteria. Mm -hmm. So to get a band nine, you need top marks in fluency and coherence, grammar, mm -hmm. vocabulary, and pronunciation. So thank you for making it this far in the video. I want to give you 10% off our VIP course. The IELTS VIP course is the most successful IELTS course in the world. That is a fact because we have more band seven, eight, and nine success stories than any other IELTS course in the entire world. We do that by simplifying the whole IELTS process, supporting you with some of the best IELTS teachers in the world, and being with you every step of the way until you get the score that you need. All you have to do is just look down in the description, just click that, and you can sign up. If you have any questions about the VIP course, always feel free to get in touch with us. We answer 100% of the questions that we get. Hope that you have become a VIP. If not, enjoy the rest of this free video. So part one, um, what the examiner is looking for is for you to answer the question and develop it a little bit. I think the key hallmark of a, of a band nine candidate in part one is it's like talking to a friend or it's like talking to a colleague. And that's how it felt talking to you. So you were able to answer each question naturally and develop them. You had no problem talking um, about any of those topics. And I really liked the way you used your own life and your own experiences in that. So it didn't feel like speaking to a robot who prepared answers. It felt like talking to a, a real human being who's at a very, very high level of English. I also threw in some more unusual uh, topics in there and you were able to, to cope with those, those perfectly. So part one, I have no negative feedback, okay. all very, very good. Mm -hmm. Part two is probably the most challenging part for a lot of students because it's a monologue. Mm -hmm. So you have to speak for up, up to two minutes. What you did was you decided to choose a, a real story from your own life. Mm -hmm. That was a very good choice because it led to a very fluent, coherent answer. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier to talk about an experience from your own life than it is to make up a story or to talk about something a little bit more abstract. So mm -hmm. we would always suggest to, to students to try and choose something in part two related to your own life. And then it's much easier then to use vocabulary um, and, and grammar as well, especially vocabulary, because you're talking about real things and real mm -hmm. experiences. And you weren't trying to, we would say, fetch the language. You weren't mm -hmm. thinking of the correct word or the correct grammar structure or the correct tense. You were just talking very coherently and, and naturally again. And I didn't have to encourage you to speak more. Um, a problem with many students is they'll speak for one minute or one minute, 30 seconds, and then you have to encourage them to speak. I had to do the opposite. I had to stop you, which is, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which was very, very good. In my opinion, uh, part three is the most challenging part because these topics like arriving late, work productivity, AI in the workplace, these are more abstract academic type, type topics when you compare them to, to part one. 
and you did very, very well. What the examiner is looking for is development uh, and uh, answering the question and then really developing it. You did that multiple times by showing both sides of, of the argument, by using examples. Sometimes you use real examples from your own life and you had no problem with, with any of those topics. The reason why towards the end I asked you more and more difficult questions is the examiner will think that you're a very good candidate, so they will ask you more and more difficult questions to see how you cope with them. So even when I asked you um, about societal changes in the future from AI, like that is a very, very difficult question. Many students in that position would just say, I don't know, or that's difficult, or I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You attempted the answer and you gave a very, you know, a coherent answer that's related to that topic mm -hmm. and you really developed it well. You could see at the end that you were struggling a little bit with, with those ideas. Yeah. But the thing to remember is that it is not an ideas test. It is a test of your English and you did, uh, you did really, really well. Now let's move on to your scores for each part. So fluency and coherence, we can break that down. Coherence is all about, did you answer the question? So if I asked you about, is it rude to be late if you're meeting a friend? You talk about meeting a friend. You don't talk about uh, being late for work, for example. Um, and every question that I asked you, you answered exactly uh, the, how it was supposed to be answered. You really stuck to that topic. The other part of coherence is development. So did you develop your answer with explanations, examples, stories, things like that? For every part, you did a really good job with that. Yeah. So full marks um, for coherence. Fluency is not speaking quickly or not speaking slowly, but really speaking without effort. Someone who is at a, a lower band, like a band six or a band seven even, they will often be searching for the correct word to use or the correct, am I using the correct grammar structure? So they'll have a lot of audible pauses, like, mm, uh, things like that. And they'll also be trying to think of ideas. Because your English level is so high, you pretty much never had to, to do that. There was never any real pauses where I was like, oh, she's trying, she doesn't really know that word. And she's trying to fetch that word from, from her brain. You spoke effortlessly about a range of different topics without any audible pauses, really. When I say without any audible pauses, I'm talking about unnatural audible pauses. Because while I'm speaking now, as a native English speaker and as an IELTS teacher, I'm pausing sometimes. That is natural. Mm -hmm. Unnatural is, as I just said, you're like thinking, oh, what's the way to say, mm -hmm. you know, to say this? You never do that. So for fluency and coherence, you would get a band nine. You would get full mark. So that, that's native English speaker level, um, which is very, very good. For pronunciation, um, there's two things that the examiner is thinking about pronunciation. The first is the most important, which is clarity. Can I understand everything that you're saying? And I could understand 100% of what you were saying. So first box is, is ticked. You have no problem mm -hmm. in that area. The second is something called higher level uh, pronunciation features. Mm -hmm. And that those are things like intonation, mm -hmm. as your voice goes up and your voice goes down naturally. Uh, lower level students will speak very monotone like this. Everything is very flat. Whereas native speakers will go up and down right. in order to um, convey meaning. I can understand 100% of what you're saying. You're using intonation at a very high level. You're using connected speech. You're using sentence stress, word stress, all very, very naturally, which allows me to understand you even more. A lot of people um, confuse a high pronunciation score with a British accent or an American accent or, or an Irish accent. Mm -hmm. The examiner is not really thinking about how British you sound or how American you sound. The examiner is thinking uh, about the clarity of your speech. So you have an, uh, an Indian accent and you should be very proud of your, <laughs> your Indian accent. But there's some people when they speak with it, not just an Indian accent, but any accent, sometimes that accent will interfere with um, the, the, the listener's ability to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. At no point does your accent interfere with, with, with what you're saying. You are from India, and in mm -hmm. India, you guys speak very, very quickly to each other. <laughs> it's not a, not a criticism, it's just naturally a lot of, a lot of you guys 
do speak like that. Would you Would you agree? Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> and, yes. um, and also being in a test situation, when we're nervous, we speak a little bit more quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes, especially with, with Indian students, when you combine the accent with speaking very, very quickly, that can sometimes cause a problem um, for, the, for the listener, but it doesn't with you. You're nervous a little bit sometimes, and you do speak a little bit quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were doing the test soon, I would suggest that that's the one thing that you would just be careful of is if you go into the test very, very nervous and you speak really, really quickly, that could affect your pronunciation score slightly, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's... I'm being overly cautious with my uh, feedback. You mixed up your v and w sounds yeah, a little yeah. bit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very common with German speakers. It's very common um, with Indian speakers. But it wasn't to the extent where I couldn't, uh, I didn't understand what you were saying. Mm-hmm. For example, Spanish speakers will say video instead of vi- video. Right. I watched a video on YouTube. Some German speakers will say I watched a video. Mm-hmm. Now that, if it was extreme, could lower your score. But you had just a very slight um, mix up between those two sounds. If every time you uh, were trying to pronounce the, you said w, that would lower your score because that is a systematic error Mm -hmm. that just keeps happening every time you you use that sound. But it wasn't the case at all with with you. So you would get a band nine for pronunciation. The next is vocabulary. So there's two things that the examiner is thinking about when it comes to uh, vocabulary. The first is accuracy. Did you use the correct words, basically? Or are you getting words mixed up? So, for example, um, you could say this is a phone, which is correct. Um, Or you could say this is an electronic device, which is correct. But phone would be a little bit more precise. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't say that this is a sitting device. You know, this is a a chair. Or if you got these mixed up, it's like, I'm sitting on a phone. Mm -hmm. Like, that that is completely wrong. So uh, you are using vocabulary correctly and precisely. Accuracy, you have no problems there. You're also using a lot of topic-specific vocabulary. Topic-specific vocabulary is, for example, to talk about phones, we would talk about a screen. We would talk about the resolution of that screen. Mm -hmm. We would talk about the memory and how many megabytes or gigabytes of the memory. But we couldn't use gigabytes to talk about a pen. For example, we couldn't talk about the resolution of a pen. Mm -hmm. Um, But we would talk about ink. But we can't use the word ink to talk about phones. So Mm -hmm. these are very topic-specific words. As you can see, no matter what topic we ask you about, you are able to pull those topic-specific words, and that indicates that no matter what topic we ask you about, you will be able to talk about that topic. So that's the second thing, that's your range. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can only talk about arriving late, but you can't talk about AI. You can talk about any topic. Mm -hmm. So the range of your vocabulary is very, very high, and the accuracy of your vocabulary is very, very high, so you get a band nine. Last but not least is grammar. Um, So your grammar, again, is being assessed by accuracy and range. The range of your grammar is very good. You pick the most appropriate structures and tenses to use. So as you can see, what you do is you don't just answer every question with the present simple tense, for example. Mm -hmm. You use the appropriate tense, the appropriate structure, to answer each question, which indicates you have a very wide range of grammar. Now, a lot of people think that to get a band nine for grammar, the accuracy needs to be 100%, but that's not actually true. What it says in the official marking criteria is that you can have a few slips. Some examiners would listen to you and think, yep, you made a few tiny little slips like this one. However, under exam, conditions, if you're stressed, you can often make little mistakes that you wouldn't normally make. Mm -hmm. And some examiners might think that you're making a few too many of these small grammatical errors. If that was the case where they thought that you were making a few too many small grammatical errors, you would get a band eight, Mm -hmm. not a band nine um, for grammar. But 
I think that you would be on the side of it just being a few slips where you would get a band nine. So I think overall, you probably would get a band nine. I think the lowest you would get would be an 8.5 mm -hmm. overall, but I would be quite confident that you would get a band nine if you, you had that performance. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank well you. done. Thank you so much. <laughs>